When a baby suddenly disappears from her crib, it sends an entire town into a panic. Who would take a baby, and how did they leave behind such little evidence? On the night of October 3rd, 2011, 11-month-old Lisa Irwin went missing from her home in Kansas City, Missouri. And despite her tragic story making national headlines, after more than a decade, no one has been able to find her. One thing is certain, there are more questions than answers surrounding this case. But the biggest question remains, where is baby Lisa Irwin? Welcome to Armchair Investigator. I'm Brooke and it's great to have you here. The case we'll be exploring today is one that's sure to leave you puzzled and frustrated. There are so many plausible theories surrounding this investigation and I cannot wait to hear your thoughts. Just when you think you know what happens, the case goes in a new direction. Now that I've told you the end of this story, I want to take you back to the beginning, to Lisa's beginning. Lisa Renee Irwin was born in Kansas City, Missouri on November 11, 2010, to Jeremy Irwin and Deborah Bradley. Lisa was a sweet and happy baby, and as the youngest, she had the love, support, and help of her two older brothers, Blake and Michael, who were five and eight years old. They adored her and were proud to be her big brothers. Debbie has said that it was at that time she felt like her life was near perfect. But all that was about to change. Just weeks before her first birthday, Lisa would vanish into the night, never to be seen by her family again. October 3rd, 2011 started out just like any other day. It was a Friday and Jeremy was putting in extra hours at work. Debbie was home with the three kids. After eating dinner, the two older kids watched movies while Debbie and a neighbor friend sat outside chatting and drinking wine. It was a good opportunity to catch up and have some company. Baby Lisa had been put to bed for the night. Around 10.30, everyone called it a night and went to bed. Jeremy had only expected to be at work that night until around 10 p.m. or so, but the project he was working on ended up taking longer. He returns home from work around 4 a.m. in the early morning hours of October 4th. Exhausted from working a double, he heads inside to get some sleep. That's when he notices that the front door to the house is unlocked. This struck him as unusual because Debbie didn't like being home alone at night. And not only that, most of the lights were on inside. During a check of the house, he finds Debbie asleep in the master bedroom along with their son. At the other end of the hallway, his oldest son is fast asleep in his room. Before getting in bed, his last stop is to check on the baby. Lisa isn't in her crib. After waking up Debbie, they begin to frantically search the house. They even wake up their two sons and have them help. Lisa couldn't get out of the crib on her own. So where was she? After searching the inside of the house, Jeremy grabs a flashlight and heads outside to search. That's when he notices a partially open window screen. Now, the window being open wasn't necessarily what concerned him. It was how the screen had been pushed in. It was time to call for help. When Jeremy ran inside to call the police, they discovered that all three of their cell phones were missing. Thankfully, he had his work phone with him. Because there's a missing baby, police immediately escalate the search and seal off the home. Nobody could find her. Hundreds, if not thousands, joined the effort to look for baby Lisa, including the National Guard. They looked everywhere. Rivers, lakes, drainage ditches, culvert pipes, landfills. Nothing was found and no leads popped up. At least 25 National Guard members and then a number of other people from many different agencies across the state of Missouri are out searching right now. Uh, they started earlier this morning. I'm joined right now with Bridget with the FBI right now. Uh, how large is this search right now and is there anything that particularly led you to come out here today with this many people? We have significant manpower out here today. Representatives, as you said, from the National Guard, lots of different Missouri law enforcement agencies as well as the FBI is out there. Desperate to find their baby, the Irwins hold a press conference and beg for her safe return. No question to ask, just drop her off with somebody at a hospital, a church, the fire department, the police station, anywhere. Just please bring her home. She's everything. She's, she's our little girl. She's completed our family and she's, she, she means everything to my boys. And we, we, we need her home. Usually when someone goes missing or is harmed, police look at those closest to the victim first. This case was no different, especially since there were no leads to follow. Investigators seized laptops and other electronics, something the Irwins were more than willing to hand over. 
Police also ask to interview their two sons alone. The Irwins agree. They give police full access to their house and property. Soon, however, police stop asking for consent and start getting search warrants. The relationship between the police and the Irwin family began to change. Items taken through the search warrant included a comforter, purple shorts, a Disney shirt, a glowworm toy, a blanket, rolls of tape, and a tape dispenser. Investigators want to know how someone could have gotten in the house, taken baby Lisa, three cell phones, and leave completely undetected. Could they have used the window or unlocked door to gain entry? Police weren't so sure. Detectives take a closer look at the damaged window. They try to recreate what it might look like if someone were to attempt to gain entry to the house through it. What they discover is that the window is high enough off the ground that it makes entering through it extremely difficult. Not only that, the dust on the windowsill hadn't been disturbed, something that wouldn't have been possible to do while climbing in. Investigators tried to recreate how an abductor might have gotten inside, as the parents have suggested, crawling through a window over and over, recording the entire thing. Law enforcement felt it wasn't a strong theory. In fact, they weren't buying the story about any intruder. Jeremy was ruled out as a suspect when they obtained surveillance footage from his employer showing him working during the time frame baby Lisa disappeared. With Jeremy having a solid alibi, police set their sights on Debbie, questioning everything she had said and done. Her first interrogation with police was 12 hours long. When they question her again, her story about the night Lisa went missing begins to change. What initially went from two glasses of wine with a friend turned into five glasses of wine and then 10 glasses. She also first told authorities that she had checked on Lisa in her crib at 6.40 p.m. and then again at 10.30. She later admitted that wasn't true because she herself was passed out by 10.30. In truth, the whole evening was a blur. The last time she could actually remember checking on the baby was around 6.30. She said if she could do it over again, she never would have drank any wine that night. Desperate to prove her innocence and get the focus back to searching for her daughter, Debbie offers to take a lie detector test. When it was over, she claims an FBI agent told her she was a terrible mother and that she had failed the test. She claims they wouldn't show her the results. They said I failed and I continue to say that's not possible because I don't know where she's at and I did not do this. Still, authorities strongly felt like she wasn't being truthful. Now, legally, law enforcement is allowed to lie to suspects they interrogate to try and get a confession. It's possible they were lying about the results from the test in hopes that she would panic and confess. Otherwise, they didn't have any evidence to charge her. After the lie detector test, the Irwins completely stopped talking to police. But earlier, the mother and father decided to quit cooperating with the police, but our door is always open. New developments tonight in the search for missing baby Lisa Irwin. Her parents are no longer cooperating with police. Now, that announcement was made just a couple hours ago at a news conference held by Kansas City police and investigators in the case. They've always been uh, free. They've been cooperative up to this point, but early this evening, they decided to stop cooperating with detectives. Could Lisa have been killed? Well, investigators aren't entirely sure. On October 19th, cadaver dogs were brought to the Irwin house. The dogs hit in Jeremy and Debbie's bedroom near the bed. But it's important to note that a dirty diaper or the contents in it could give a false positive. A community that once rallied around the Irwins start becoming suspicious of them and look at them as possible suspects. According to neighbors, they say that they have been defending Lisa Irwin's parents for the last several days and now they're not really sure what to think. Was it truly a coincidence that the first night Jeremy had to work late, baby Lisa goes missing? And what about the police's inability to recreate entry into the house through the damaged window? All that coupled with the supposedly failed lie detector test and cadaver dog hit in their bedroom, it didn't look good for the Irwins. Feeling like they had nobody on their side, the Irwins were distraught. To them, it felt like a witch hunt. Until three different people tell police they had seen a man in the area carrying an infant the night Lisa went missing. This takes the investigation in a new direction. The first sighting was around midnight, just a few houses down from the Irwin family. A nearby resident had just left home and was heading into work when he drives by a man holding a baby. It stuck out to him because the baby wasn't dressed for the cold weather. And also, who's walking around with a baby at midnight? 
The man was so unsettled by what he saw, he called his wife and told her to lock the doors and windows. Better to be safe than sorry. They would end up reporting it to police on the morning of October 4th. Sighting number two came from a gas station about a mile from the Irwins. They captured on video surveillance a man walking out of the woods around 2.15 a.m. The clerk thought this was suspicious because typically nobody entered the woods by the gas station due to how heavy and thick the brush was there. It shows an unidentified man walking down the street at 2.15 in the morning of October 4th, the morning baby Lisa, Lisa disappeared from her home. And the gas station owner we spoke to say says that it is very unusual to see somebody walking down the street at that hour. The final sighting was around 4 a.m. when a motorcycle driver who'd just gotten off work reported seeing a man carrying a baby. He fit the same description as the other two sightings. The gentleman on the motorcycle pulled over to ask if they needed a ride and offered to call somebody. He also pointed out that the baby needed a blanket, but the man just shook his head no and kept walking. Unfortunately, the man on the motorcycle didn't find out about the news of missing baby Lisa until a week after their interaction. After seeing photos of Lisa on the news, he calls police to tell them about the run-in he had with a man carrying an infant and said he really believed it was baby Lisa. So we have sightings at midnight, 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. A dumpster fire was also started that evening just down the street from the Irwin home. To add even more suspicion, baby clothes were found in that dumpster. When Debbie put Lisa to bed, she was wearing purple shorts and a purple t-shirt with kittens on it. However, the neighbor couple from the first sighting at midnight said the baby they saw didn't appear to be wearing any clothing. The woman told ABC News, We seen the little arm, the leg. It didn't look like the baby had on any clothes, just a diaper. And remember, this is October. It was 45 degrees outside that night. It's possible that whoever abducted Lisa removed her clothes and threw them in the dumpster, knowing that when her parents reported her missing, they would be describing what she had on that night. The man who reported the fire said that the flames were shooting several feet into the air, and he believed some kind of accelerant was used. Now, a name begins popping up over and over in regards to this unknown man carrying a baby. John Tanko, aka Jersey Tanko, a local drifter in the neighborhood who did odd jobs for cash. He was no stranger to police. He had a lengthy record that consisted of burglary, possession, breaking and entering, and get this, at the time, he was living just one block up from the Irwin home. Guess his preferred method for breaking into homes. Yup, entering through windows. Oh, and also, he's a known pyromaniac. Yeah. In the late 90s, early 2000s, he served time for arson. What's even more damning is that eyewitnesses physically saw him just down the street from the Irwins at 11.30 the night Lisa went missing. Could John have noticed that Jeremy's work truck, which was normally home, wasn't in the driveway like usual? Did he take that as an opportunity to break in the Irwins' home? With the front door left unlocked and Debbie having drank a lot of wine, it's possible he was able to sneak in and out unnoticed. Earlier, I had mentioned that three cell phones were also stolen from the kitchen. When investigators obtained phone logs, they noticed a 50-second call had been placed from one of the phones the night baby Lisa, Emma Phones, vanished. The call was to a woman named Megan Wright. That name is especially important because she had an on-again, off-again relationship with John Tanko. And prior to that night, Megan's phone number had never been received nor dialed out from any of the Irwins' phones, meaning the Irwins weren't in any type of regular contact with Megan. But what's the motive? Why would John take a baby to begin with? The answer might shock you. When police question Megan, she tells them that she desperately wanted to have a child, and John knew this. At the time Lisa was taken, she was trying to distance herself from John and move on. It's possible John may have taken baby Lisa in hopes of reconciling with Megan and raising the baby together. I can't believe I'm saying that. Weirder things have happened though. Police arrest John on outstanding warrants and take him into custody. He denies everything and asks for a lawyer. Authorities know they aren't going to get anything out of him but they want to see if any of the eyewitnesses would be able to positively ID him. They bring in the witnesses that saw a man carrying a baby the night Lisa disappeared. One witness positively identifies John, telling police that was the man he saw. 
but other witnesses said John was not the man they saw. John's not saying a peep, and there's no physical evidence tying him to Lisa's disappearance. Police have to let him go. Another dead end. Listen to this. About a month after Lisa's disappearance, Jeremy's debit card suddenly gets suspended for a fraudulent charge of $69.04. Two other charges were also attempted but failed. Somehow, his debit card information had been stolen and someone had fraudulently used his card on a British website that allowed legal name changes for children and adults. I can't. I would have totally lost it if I was Jeremy or Debbie. How can you not immediately assume that not only has someone stolen your daughter, but they've also stolen your debit card and are using your money to legally change your daughter's name in order to conceal her identity? No. And yes, it was confirmed that this website actually exists. But for some reason, Kansas City Police felt it wasn't a promising lead. How frustrating. Leads stop trickling in and eventually police move on to other cases. The investigation goes cold. Two years go by and then one day police get a call from halfway around the world. Interpol believes a young girl found at a Roma camp in Greece looked a lot like the age progression photos of baby Lisa. What? The little girl was spotted peeking out from under a blanket as police swept the settlement for suspected drug trafficking. Because the child in this camp stood out so much with her blonde hair, blue eyes, and pale skin, it was believed she may have been abducted. The couple claiming to be her parents gave at least five conflicting accounts of how the little girl ended up with them, at one point saying she was found outside a grocery store. Now, Debbie and Jeremy look at the photos of that little girl and agree that there was some resemblance. So, working with the FBI, they send their DNA to Greece. Greek police take the little girl into custody and test her DNA. It wasn't Lisa. Another devastating blow for the family. But they haven't given up hope and believe that baby Lisa is alive. She is still classified as a missing person and the case remains open. She would be turning 12 this year. If you think you might have any information regarding baby Lisa, it's worth speaking up. Call 816-474-8477. It's so sad to think that her parents and brothers have had to watch her grow up through age progression photos. I can't even imagine how that must feel. I know I've given you a lot to unpack, but what are your thoughts and theories? I can't wait to hear from you. I'm not entirely sure her parents, or specifically Debbie, had anything to do with Lisa's disappearance. I don't know, it's just a feeling that I get. If you liked today's video, give it a thumbs up, and hey, while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on the next investigation.